You know, I kind of resist the idea of a philosophy of teaching. It sounds a little bit too coherent for me. I have some, and in fact, no, I'm, I'm, when I have somebody write a philosophy of teaching or a teaching statement, if I get it in a job application, I generally don't read it. I'd rather see them in the classroom, those things. That's going to say it's student-centered. It's going to say, so, um, but I do have a couple of principles, and I think the thing that <clears throat> has guided me the most is the sense that teaching is both completely holistic. Uh, it is whatever I am. It's organic. Whatever I have in myself that I don't like, something's going to happen in the classroom that's going to bring it out. So it's a virtue for me. I have to become the best possible person I can be if I'm going to be the best teacher I can be. So that means I'm constantly working on being a better person, um, being more patient. Being this year, kind of my effort has been to be more merciful because I've tended to be, you know, when I got out of grad school, and I was pretty much, I'm introducing you to the wonderful world of religious studies, and it's fabulous. And more and more, it's like I'm trying to get you from where you are to find something that's going to be meaningful to you, and that when you forget what puja means, you're going to still have something in you, just as teaching is who I am, the learning is who you are, and you're going to bring something about this that's going to help you to be a better person. So it's very much about who people are all together. So that's one side of it. And the other side of the way I see teaching is that it's a technique mm -hmm. and that there are things you can learn. And the biggest one I've been working on this year, so I've got mercy on the internal side. Um, and the other one is yes and, which is absolutely lifted from improv. So whenever anyone says anything to you, the first thing you do is affirm, and then you take it to the next step. So whereas in my early teaching days, if I asked a question, somebody gave a wrong answer, I might say something that could roughly be translated as no. Now I say something that starts out as being translated as yes. Like that's, now that's very interesting because, or I'm really glad you said that because. Um, and then to start bringing it back eventually if we need to go back to where the question I asked was taking us, uh, then to lead us back in that direction, but always to affirm the student first who's been willing to say something and contribute to class. So that's been the technique that I've been working on most this year. And I don't know if it's coincidence that my students seem to be asking more questions and bringing up more ideas. I'd like to think that you know, we're building a better conversation because I've learned to address them first with affirmation. That is part of mercy for me. The mercy goes pretty deep. Like I say, I think of that as something internal that I constantly need to be developing for me as a better person and assuming that that's going to play out in the classroom in some ways that I will notice right away and I hope this is something that will grow over years. But I think part of that is mercy. I had a lot of very merciful teachers and I don't think I appreciated it that much at the time because I was getting A's, I was smart, I was a good student. Um, but I'm sure a lot of the times that they affirmed me they were probably being merciful. They might not have put it that way. They might have thought they were being encouraging. For me, as a Christian, mercy has a pretty deep resonance. So that's something that I have found a helpful way to ground myself. Am I being merciful to these students? When you get the third email asking something that's on the syllabus, um, what's the merciful response to that? As somebody who has received mercy and who now wants to give it back, while well, also you know teaching them to live. Yes, you can read complicated documents like syllabi. I believe you can. You will get better at it. At the same time, I'm not going to just jump on you and say, what does the syllabus say in that tone of voice? That does seem to me actually to be maybe a more advanced level than what I'm trying to do with mercy and humility and so on is to actively be grateful. Although, you know, I'm, I'm about to head into this semester's batch of research papers. Um, so in this world religions for the Judaism section, they all have to do a biblical exegesis and we do it over a month and I look at drafts and we have to compare commentaries and then we have a big party and they all, you know, give three or four lines on what they learn. And I always learn something from that. And as they go through the drafts, and they suffer horribly through this thing, I mean, they're commiserating, they're hating me, I don't even, you know, not that I'd go and rate my professor anyway, but this would really be the time not to go and rate my professor. And, uh, but I can honestly tell them, thank you, because I'm learning from you. And I can tell them that on the drafts when they're rough and all that stuff that, oh, I've never heard this before, and that's really interesting. So, I mean, I, I'd like to develop that more, I think, to go from the mercy, which is kind of extending to you 
what I would like to have extended and have had extended to me, to realizing that you have something I haven't given people. You know something I don't know. Certainly, if they're willing to raise their hand and say, Professor, that's not quite right. The textbook actually talks about it this way. I would never have had the courage for that when I was in college. So I think that's actually a great growing edge for me, is to be more grateful for what they have to offer. Well, I think most people are teachers most of the time um, in pretty daily ways. I mean, by the questions you have chosen, you're teaching me something about how you see teaching and how I can see teaching. Um, but I hope that there are times, I think I'm more comfortable as a student, hence the 28th grade thing. Um, it's the learning that keeps me energized. So in that sense, I hope that most of what I'm doing is learning and being a student. And although all of us have to teach each other all the time, I mean, you don't know, well, you have a hint of my finding this room and that there was some help needed in that. So thank goodness for all those teachers, we wouldn't call them that, but who said, no, if you keep going that way, you will be in the mountains. So, but I hope a lot of the time, um, I mean, even in that very good, helpful, not the power structure way, I hope that there are times that I can put that aside and just uh, embrace the particular humility of being a student. I think that's why I teach world religions. That wasn't my primary training. I did mostly you know, ancient Greek stuff and Christian stuff, but that was something I needed to learn. And fortunately, through grant opportunities, including some stuff from Wabash, I was able to do that, because that's what I thought the students in our context weren't getting in their curriculum. They were saying they wanted to learn this. I'm like, I want to learn this. Maybe I can learn enough of it so then we can learn it you know, together and I won't lead them astray. So I think I'd prefer being a student. If you had really pushed me on the philosophy of teaching thing, and thank you for not doing that, but if you had, uh, one of the things I could have drawn on was back when I was doing my master's in Eden Harvard, one of the things I heard in studies may say something different now, was that one of the things that correlated most with effective teaching was the teacher's passion for his or her subject matter. And you know, having had sabbatical last year, and being able to sit down and read and take notes and think about, not right now, because I've got a whole year. What might I eventually want to say about this? What might I eventually want to write about this or present about this? Uh, and realizing that I could just think and enjoy that process and even on occasion, believe it or not, say, I'm kind of smart. Uh, you know? There, there's something very gratifying about that. And the other thing was that some of it was really difficult. And I am grateful, this is true, this is where the gratitude comes in for me for sure, when I try something and it's really hard for me. Um, like I tried learning guitar a few years ago. Um, and uh, my husband periodically teaches me how to work the backup batteries on the sump pump, which God knows I should know. I'm a homeowner and I, this stuff makes no sense to me. He can show me five times and I don't get it. And that I bring into the classroom too. Um, so that's something that's changed for me over the years, you know, come out of grad school, this is exciting, and why are you not getting it? And now I'm like, I know why you're not getting it, because you're going to be brilliant with a sump pump. And I am totally hopeless with a sump pump. So I am very grateful for the things I try that I absolutely stink at. And if I work at it, I can get a little, well, maybe not the sump pumps. Guitar I got better at. I got well, it has happened at Wabash. We once did a presentation, and I played Love Me Tender in the background. It was very special. I think there are five people still scarred by that experience, but I did not sing, and that was what saved it. Yeah.